I'm Haley from Gallifrey Public Radio, a Doctor Who fandom podcast and part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. The Intellectual Podcast starts now. Welcome back to the Intellectual Podcast. I'm your host, David S. Dawson, coming at you from the Intellectual Entertainment Studios in quarantine. Joining me remotely are my co-host, Stephen Schwartz. How you doing? Whitney Wegman-Wood. Hello, hello. And joining us for a conversation today is uh, producer-director Fred Ashman. Hello. Glad to be here. And I guess we add author to that too, right, Fred? You, yes, indeed. I do have a book that I finished uh, in 2019 that's out now, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. But maybe uh, first we talk about what people can do in quarantine to be ready to come back when uh, things start to get back to normal, and they will. I think that's um, fantastic because um, I know a lot of people are really kind of concerned. Uh, you know, they were they had momentum going or they were in the middle of projects or – you know, they just are frightened right now about how to keep themselves uh, motivated uh, while they're, you know, forced to stay at home. What, what advice would you have for them, Fred? Well, a couple of things. Uh, I had this happen at, during 9-11. We were one of the biggest, if not the biggest, production company in, in, the, in San Diego County and doing a lot of international work. And every single project we had, and we're talking some very large projects, all canceled completely instantly at that moment. Mm -hmm. So what we did was uh, we didn't lay anybody off, but I ended up uh, having to sell my house to save the company. Uh, but the but the bottom line was we used the time to regroup, think things through, and start to plan on how we're coming back. And we stayed in touch with the clients. Uh, electronically and sometimes by phone, just letting them know we're going to be here when you come back and just assuring them that we're okay. Uh, so they look at especially small producers and providers uh, as are they going to even be there? So you want to retain your relationship. I would do that first. Second is think through uh, where you can Take the time to put together uh, a, a new reel. Uh, stay in, in contact using your social media and help to build your brand as you're solid and you're going to be there, even if you're scared to death that you're not. Uh, mm. That is help, in my opinion. Um, and you, you t also think about, and this goes to when you're back and working in all the time, is what is your brand? What are you known for? Uh, are you consistent? Because, you know, a brand is all about really consistency. You think right. about McDonald's, you instantly know any McDonald's you go to is going to be uh, the same thing. You know what to expect. Uh, if you buy a brand, if you buy a Ford, you know what you're getting. You buy a Lexus or you buy a Mercedes, you know what you're getting. Um, for those of you uh Wait a minute. We're all independent producers. No, it's, there's nobody buying a Ferrari. So let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, maybe you, some of us well, go with Toyotas. <laughs> but we get the one, idea. <laughs> one of the things about brand for the independent producer, uh, and I have a great example. When I was first starting out, I always wanted to uh, fly, and I got Western Airlines uh, pretty uh, early in our career, in my career, as one of my first big clients. And I would have to go up to meetings at LAX. And being a company of, I had a receptionist and me, and then everybody else was uh, part time. Uh, I had to go up to these meetings, but with an hour and a half to two hours in the car each way, it really killed the time that you had to do work on projects because. Most of us, you sell it, you write it, you produce it, uh, you bring in crew and such to shoot, then you edit it, and then you uh, take it to the client. So 
every minute of your day is really important. And I always wanted to learn to fly. So I did learn to fly during that time. I used the because they were paying me decent money and I wasn't taking hardly any salary. So just enough to live on. So I learned to fly and I would go with my instructor and fly into LAX and park at their hangar, which is now Delta's hangar. And it just said to them, holy cow, this guy's coming in a private twin engine airplane up here to these meetings. He's somebody. And then I did <laughs> read the work for them and they liked it. I mean, I was nobody, but uh, it looked like somebody. So that's part of your brand. What are you, you know, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing to make it clear that you are not just another person off the street? One of the things is also that's real easy to do. Uh, the airplane thing was cool, but and, uh, I did learn to fly and it helped. But the, but and the it cuts real, down on your commute. Yeah, I cut down on the commute. Well, I, I use the airplane. I've, I've owned four over the years and I've used them as really time machines. It's a way that I could go to L.A., go into the studios, re do recording sessions and, and, and shoots uh, and finish up at 5 p.m. on Friday in Burbank and be home in my home within one hour or less. Uh, and that including, you know, landing the air, taking off, landing and driving home. Try to do that on a Friday at five in L.A. <laughs> and if, even what I was doing, it, it's no different. They just have more jammed uh, uh, lanes on the freeway than they did then. But the, but the idea is the same. It's, uh, it's time control. But the other thing I want to mention is how do you dress? There's a lot of people who think dressing grunge is great. Well, maybe that's for the Hollywood drama kinds of things that you, you want to do. But if you're dealing with corporations and, and people, uh, dress at equal or a little bit better than what they expect. You come in looking like a pro, business type person, and yet you're, you know, we're not wearing ties necessarily, uh, unless you're going East Coast and meeting with some really high end people, then you might. But this, at the same time, just a, a sports jacket for a, a gentleman and something uh, a little bit more conservative, casual uh, for the ladies as well. It, it just sets a tone that says that you are a pro. Uh, in their minds. Now, well, it may it's not a question be of knowing your audience, right? Oh, absolutely. And and actually, that's whether it's an audience of one or the huge audience of your of your production. Understanding that audience and knowing, I don't know. Even even when I got to know them pretty well, there were certain people that I I always dressed a little bit more for. If I went East Coast, I was meeting with a a really senior person in a big company. Uh, in at times, I would wear, and I would even today would wear a suit and tie. N mostly not so much today, but it, I'd still be slacks, sport shirt, and you know, kind of dressed a bit. So it, it makes a difference. It makes a difference at that level. Yeah, I've had that conversation with a number of uh, people in the last like six months. Um, I've been mentoring a lot of. A lot of technicians um, who are fairly young and fairly new to to the working world, really, you know, and they want to have the long rock star hair and, you know, the grungy beard. And I keep telling them that that's fine if you just want to stay, you know, kind of one of the guys working in the shadows. But if you want to become a lead, if you want to move up in your in your career and advance yourself forward, you got to understand that you're you're face forward for the clients as well as the people you're working alongside with here. And you have to understand your presentation of yourself matters. Oh, that's absolutely true, Dave. Uh, and I think one of the things, too, that as you're working with these clients, there's a, a thing that I, and I talk about it in my book quite a bit. It's thought leadership. And it's it really is basic leadership, but it's leading the project. And think about this, how many of these uh, folks, when they go out and talk to a client, say, well, what do you want me to do? Or what do you want? That's not a question that you want to ask. You want to say, what are you trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. Who's your audience? Uh, all the other questions that really lead to 
finding a solution. You want to be a problem solver and the using the client to share the responsibility in case it doesn't work, which is what subliminally, subliminally a lot of us do or shouldn't do, but sometimes do, is the wrong, uh, wrong way to go about it. And for example, you go in and you ask them about the things that they're trying to accomplish. What are your goals? Tell me about this audience. What, did, what do they not know that you want them to know? Because so often you're, you're looking at some of these uh, companies and, and the people in them are putting the same information out in different forms to this audience, uh, whoever that audience is, sometimes in, internal uh, more than external. But the people in the internal audience have the biggest BS meters of any audience you're going to work with. <laughs> they know what's going on in the company. And if you're and if you're BSing them, they completely turn off and you lose your your client loses uh, any clout that they have or believability factor. So you want to know what it is that is important that needs to be communicated. Then you got to figure out a way to communicate it that is not only uh, if it's assuming that it's visual. Uh, that is not only interesting, but entertaining. And you right. want to find some way to touch people with your pictures and your words and, and music, uh, if you use it, or sound effects. But, but tell that story so it touches them somehow emotionally. So you get a, and a client, a good example is a client has a new software product. Oh, boy, that's really exciting. That's really personal, isn't it? Well, no, it is. But what you do is you make the story about how it helps people live a better life, work better, achieve something. So you come at that whole story a whole different way. Then you try to figure out how do I tell it visually instead of with words. Uh, right. So many script writers for these things write uh, radio scripts. It's not radio. It's visual. Tell it with words. And if you can tell it with no words at all, uh, that's even better. I said, tell it with words, tell it with pictures is what I meant to say. And right. so if you tell it with pictures, but then have just a few key words to set it up, that's a great way to go. And the other thing is I, I tell my clients that, you know, the video is really for the big picture. So they understand what the big picture is going into a lot of little details in a video is probably not the best thing to do. There's other ways. Oh, I've, uh, had, both I've had so many clients who want to tell every little piece of detail about their product within a you know minute and a half long video. And the video ends up being five minutes long. I keep telling them you can't get stuck in the weeds when you're talking about making the video. <laughs> the video absolutely is encouraging right. them to get the other information. Exactly right. And so uh, the script writing, the drama dialogue style, which all the young people seem to want to, oh, we all want to go in Hollywood and do the dramas. Well, okay, fine. Take a shot at it. But you're in with, you know, about 45 million other people trying to do the same thing. Uh, and those of us, well, I had my shot at Hollywood uh, and I had a William Morris agent and I met some of the people at the top and I turned around, walked away and made my entire career in the corporate side. But I ended up doing a feature. I ended up doing IMAX films. I ended up doing a million dollar documentary that won a bunch of awards. And we made another, uh, well, it cost a million dollars to do it. We made all that back and made another half a million on top. And we never aired it. It's never aired uh, because Discovery Channel uh, wanted uh, to pay us 150000 and they wanted all the rights to it. And I had two words for them. The first was a verb. The second was a pronoun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the bottom line is you, you just don't know where these opportunities are going to come up. Uh, but if you're working in a always trying to get, work into a larger uh, theater or arena, you want to go to where the bigger budgets are and you have to be able to deliver product that looks as close as you can to the Hollywood feature film feel or the big network television special 
or the uh, Ken Burns documentary, whatever the the genre that you are working in at the moment. And you have to be flexible to change the look and change the feel. But you need to be able to connect with people on that human level. And if you do that, you'll be way ahead of almost everybody else in the corporate business, which is what we did. And we kept looking for the bigger and bigger uh, theater in which to play. Uh, so, for example, when you've got American Airlines, that whole story was is fascinating. And, and a lot of these stories are in the book, uh, Advocate for the Audience. But the American Airlines came to us and they had a, uh, a, a, pro, a production that was done in New York all about their new West Coast product because they were introducing uh, the flagship service, you know, inter intercontinental, uh, transcontinental from New York to the California. So it was the California show. And somebody, it was a big company in New York, actually did a show. And it, ours, ours was a bit three screen on about San Diego. And they had one about California. And they wanted to use this at a big, big travel agent meeting in San Diego. So they were going to open with our show and then run theirs. And the guy flew out here to see our show. And we set it up in our little theater and ran it. And he turned to his colleague and said, man, we got a problem. And I looked at him, I thought, oh, crap, my, my show's not good enough. And I said, well, is, is my show not good enough? And he said, no, 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 ours isn't. You're, if we run yours before we run ours, we make ours look like garbage. <laughs> and I was going, wow, this is the first time I'd ever met anybody from American Airlines. And by the way, everything was I ever did was almost 99% based on a referral. Somebody at their office knew the people at Western and heard about our work for Western in video and, and in, in live events as well. So that's why they came out. So the bottom line was, he said, uh, what would you charge me to, uh, to do a California show to redo ours from scratch? Now, I was pretty young in the business. And I didn't have a freaking clue is what it was going to really call. I, I knew what I pr probably could do. I'd already done, I'd done Western airline shows and such and did some things, but this was getting it out of my normal comfort zone for sure. So right. I looked at him and I thought and I'm going, Oh my God, I'm, I'm trying to run numbers in my brain and going, this isn't going to work. I have no, I have no damn clue what I'm going to do. So I turned to him. I said, well, how about you pay me whatever you paid them? Now, I knew that this was a big New York company. I knew whatever they were charging is going to be more than I would charge. Right. Uh, so I, I took a flyer with it and he gave me a number and he said, will that work? And I said, yes. And we did it and they loved it. And that began what would become a 36 year relationship. 36 years of all their biggest work. I mean, multi-million dollar IMAX films, those kinds of things that came later. But that's how it started. And when they got it all done and they loved it, he came up to me afterwards and he said, what were you going to charge me for it? And I gave him my number, which was about 40% lower than what they paid me. And I said, how much were you willing to pay me? He says, double what you got. <laughs> wow, yeah, awesome everybody guys. hedging their bets. Well, they they were fine with it, and they they were not over the. You know, they had them really over a barrel. Now, had, had I known that, would I have charged them double just because I knew that they had them over the barrel? No, because it goes to one of the other ingredients that you really need to think about, and that's your integrity, the integrity of solving the problem and doing it at a fair and reasonable price, not taking advantage when you have the advantage. Right. Uh, and, and I have one other quick story, if you got time for it. Uh, I, I had that happen one other time. And in American, there's a lot of American Airlines stories in my book because it, they really did provide a lot of examples of how to succeed. And I was called into a meeting to talk about the new national sales meeting, which we were doing every year. And while I was there, the uh, vice president of advertising uh, saw me and said, oh, hey, you're here. What are you doing? I said, I'm meeting with Mr. God. And he says, well, I've got a, a meeting uh, with the ad agency 
about a video we need. And it's an event in Germany. And can you uh, sit in? I said, sure. So I sat in and the agency was there with seven guys. Now, they never do these live or live events uh, or even long form videos. They do all the advertising. And I was doing the, all the long term or long form videos, usually six to eight minutes, maybe 10 minutes on a big one. So I sat in this meeting and they were going on and on about how they're going to open the uh, the event with a video in in Germany. And it's a live event with about 3000 European travel agents. And they needed to establish the brand because American was opening up service to Germany. And, and, and the expanded service all th throughout Europe. So they had this big plan and they had, you know, the whole team in there pitching it. And it was front to back a, about a six to seven minute commercial. And they had all the flights, how the flights are going to be and the schedules and the fares and all of that. And they were using all their existing footage from commercials they'd shot to put this thing together. And we got all done. And it was very similar to the kind of, uh, I call them montage pieces that we did with a story underneath uh, for the comp for, for American. And they're really uh, image and branding pieces to set mm -hmm. up these live meetings. And so we got all done and we he turned to the agency, says, how much you charge me to do that? And they said about $450,000. And they said, well, so it'll have original music too. And, they turned to me and said, uh, what will you do it for? I said, probably about a hundred grand less. And that would include going to Europe and shooting some new, new footage, plus using everything that we have available and some stock. Uh, but we'll go and shoot as well. And, but yeah, I can bring it in for 350. That was the other thing though. They knew that anytime I committed to a number, that's the number it came in on. Never over, uh, never have an overage that, or any expect unexpected charges at the end, because that's how you lose clients almost instantly right. because you make the boss like he screwed up to his boss on the budget. So anyway, uh, I, so I told him that and that you could see the agency guys are just starting to burn. They're going, Oh, this guy's going to get this job. We really, really want this job. So. And I turned to Tom, Tom Morris, who was the VP, and I said, Tom, is this in your budget? He says, oh, no, this is way out of my budget. It's actually going to really screw my budget up for the year. It came up last minute. Uh, and I said, well, what if I could solve your problem for $45? <laughs> Just like right now. Dead quiet. <laughs> you got my attention. Okay, how, how do you do that? <laughs> How the hell do you do that, pal? I said, well, we have a, a video. Remember last year's video, a Silver Machine, it's sitting on the shelf. And I have it in PAL because at that time everything was, you know, standard def. And uh, I have it in PAL on the shelf and uh, I'll have it. I'll make a call and I'll have it to you uh, tomorrow. And he said, and the agency said, well, that was last year and we changed the uh, the flight attendant uniforms have changed. So anything you have in there is, is outdated. And and it doesn't have anything in it about the schedules and it doesn't have anything in it about the pricing of this these new flights. And I said, well, look, guys, you, you keep thinking like it's a commercial. It's not a commercial. It's a live event. And the purpose of this is to establish the brand to an audience who really doesn't know what American Airlines is. They think that... American Airlines is an airline from America and American Airlines, whether it's Delta, United, Continental, whoever, they don't know that American is American. They really don't know who American is over there yet. So this establishes what the, who the brand is. The, the new uniforms are so close to the old ones, unless you're an insider, you wouldn't know. And this sets up the brand. And they said, yeah, but it doesn't have any of the uh, important things in it like the the schedules and the pricing. And I said, it's a live event. Somebody's got to get up and talk about that. You, you establish the brand and you set the tone. And then the live person comes up and he talks about, or she talks about each of the components. And by the time you get to that in, in 60 days from now, everything will have changed two, three times. So you'll have the <laughs> latest information and you put it up on the slides behind them and 
they can talk about it because they have to have something to talk about. So they'll be able to talk specifically to the market and to the people in the room. And and Tom turns to me and says, well, what's the $45 for? I said, that's to cover the federal ex- express charge to have it on your desk tomorrow morning. <laughs> and as we're walking out, <laughs> the people are pissed. <laughs> And I, and I and I turned to Tom and I said, well, I guess I'm a pretty crappy salesman because I just walked away from th- over $300,000. And Tom turned to me and he said, well, Fred, yeah, you, you didn't get the sale, but you own the client. Right. Nice. And they're very good. Yeah. It, it's well, a so Fred, between, it's the difference between short term think short term thinking with your client and long term thinking with your client. Yeah, well, exactly. Is there some clients that you want to walk away from? Uh, the ones who put everything to bid, the uh, creative bidding, and I have a whole chapter about uh, no one to hold them, no one to fold them, no one to walk away, and to tell, no one to tell them to show it up their backside. Uh, and I have. I remember I, I that. Did that. I had to resign Chevrolet uh, because they they don't pay their bills and. The they have an accounting department that's the uh, accounts payables their own division uh, and quote the VP that we were working for he says I love your guys work and everything but I said yeah but you guys owe me a half a million dollars and you passed ninety days and he uh, says oh you have to have your lawyer write a nasty letter then they'll pay you <coughs> and and I said what's that about he says our accounts payable department makes their bonus about how badly they f over com- small companies like you. I said, I can't work that way. And he says, I know. We, we get somebody really good like you guys, and then we have, to, um, we have to see them go away because we treat them so badly. But it's out of my control. It's, they're their own division, and they have to pay all the bills. So there's I'm shocked they like that. that. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, I just go said ahead. I'm shocked they even admitted to something like that. Well, this was the VP of the company that was buying our services, and he's been this through, through this so many times before, and we had a really good rapport. I, got, I made friends and became uh, a really part of their team with all of these long-term clients that we had. Most of the clients we had were at least five years, and a lot of them uh, were in the 25-year-plus category. It depends on when management change uh, you know, senior management change. Sometimes they come in and everybody who used to be there needs to be gone. Uh, but mostly we were able to go through multiple changes of management and still retain these clients because we became an integral part of their team. We had something called institutional knowledge. Uh, so we, we had history we understood the client, we understood the audiences that they were talking to, and we figured out how to create always new, fresh videos and, and, and events that really connected with the audience. And we got the results that they wanted. Uh, the senior vice president of marketing, uh, who later became EVP, and when we started, he was general sales manager, uh, once told me, he says, Fred, you know that everybody in the world comes and pitches us constantly. He says, but we stay with you because we've never found anybody else who captures the heart of what this company is really about better than you guys do. So that was that was what you, you'd want and, and try to do, but you really have to pay attention, but you also don't want to ever walk into sessions, and this goes back to what I talked about earlier with thought leadership, you don't say, well, here are three uh, voiceover talent for this project. Which one do you want? No, a, a doctor doesn't go and say, well, I've got a choice of this scalpel or that one or something else. Which one do you want? No, you're the, you're the expert. You're supposed to be solving their problems, not involving them in trying to make decisions. If you're working with somebody senior at all, they're already making so many decisions. They don't want to be making these kind of decisions. That's your job. And if you can't do it, then they'll get somebody who who will do it and make it easy for them because you have to be respectful of their time and their intellectual time as well. So, well, and, and vice versa. I've worked with some clients who wanted to be part of making every single decision that they hired me to make. And I've had to fire the client because trying to work with them that way is not worth my time either. 
It's, you're exactly right, David. Uh, and and that uh, that's when one of those walk aways. And I, I, but I like to use that example of the doctor or the at some other uh, the the artist uh, who's painting your portrait. Do you want to you know tell them what brush to use? And, and which colors to use if they're painting your portrait? Or are you going to, did you hire them because of what they can do? And I have been able to turn a few of them around. And we had one uh, was uh, one of the team members at Pitney Bowes. And it was really interesting because he uh, was, he was not a fan of, of our company to start with and actually tried to set, sort of sabotage some of the work we did. But later he, we just killed him with kindness and went around him when he uh, caused a problem. But it was very interesting because when he got moved over to another division, one of the first things he had did was hired us to do his big shows. And the re we asked him why, because you, you were never a fan of ours. He says, oh, I know, I, I kind of want to do my own thing, but I got over here and now I'm going to be held responsible for the uh, results and you guys get results. <laughs> so, I mean, that works, right? Uh, I would also just ask the, the three of you, what do you call ROI, good, good ROI, ROI for your client on, and for yourself in a project? I'm well, sorry. I'm, I'm going to have to recuse myself from this because I've never had this, never been in this situation to where I, I would have to actually pitch something. I have yet to pitch something to a client. So um, I'm going to step back and I think David has got a little bit more experience well, in this. Yeah. yeah. When, David would be closer to your expert on this. It comes down to ROI with me. Um, and when it comes down to budget, questions and stuff which is you know especially at my level you know every penny matters to the small businesses that i work with you know ultimately i i i ask them you know what what do you feel the roi is going to be on what we do for you you know and once i put that question to them uh sometimes i lose the work <laughs> because they realize that it doesn't really work for what they're doing. And they didn't ask themselves that question to begin with. And I'm okay with that. If I save them the money, you know? Um, but then oftentimes once, once you actually get that into that question with them and they look at what you're doing for them, what you're offering to do for them versus what they anticipate getting in return from the response. And they go, Oh gosh. Uh, yeah, no, you're actually undercharging us, <laughs> you know? Um, but it really is. It's it's about it's knowing your audience and knowing what what you're expecting to get from telling the story to them. Yes, I, I have a I, really specific. Go ahead, go ahead, Fred. Oh well, I have a really specific question for you, Fred, in regards to this because you've been talking about branding and knowing your audience, and um, I'm curious for you as a producer, filmmaker, and as a salesperson. I'm sure you can speak to this in all those areas, and maybe your book has it too. Um, when it comes to actors, we have a lot of actors as audience members. I'm an actor. Um, how can we manage our businesses more in the realm of how you manage your business as, as performers in marketing ourselves? And what would you suggest that actors do right now during this quarantine as well as in the future? I feel like you would have a lot of insight in this respect for, for branding and uh, marketing oneself. Well, I think that it's the, the actor, uh, God bless them, all of you who are, are actors, you have one of the hardest jobs and it's the most competitive out there. It's very, very hard to get consistent calls because a lot of it, in, especially in the, uh, well, in, in any uh, area of it, it you, you look the way you look. You can modify and change, and, and David just did some things with uh, makeup that were pretty fun that I saw on, on the internet. But <laughs> the, the thing is, you are, you are who you are, so what is your brand and what are you really good at? I've worked uh, with a, a guy you probably have heard of, uh, Jonathan Banks, uh, several times. And the first yeah. time I worked with him, uh, Jonathan, uh, we, we shot for my feature, and I, Jonathan was in my feature, and we shot in... 
Oh, well, he showed up at uh, 7 a.m. Uh, everything had been on site for two hours at that point. And we had a, a fairly complex shoot with in a restaurant with about 40 extras and uh, three uh, speaking parts, four speaking parts. And we shot it all in one day. And we had Jonathan in and out, in, including doing his voiceover work for the piece um, by about two o'clock in the afternoon. And he said, how did you guys do that? And it, it looks like a feature. And we had, a, it was probably one of the bigger crews we had. We had about uh, 30 people on the crew. And just, we knew what I hired, really good people to surround me and, and got all the things he needed. He says, I'll work for you or whatever you want to pay me on anything in the future. But it was the reason I wanted Jonathan because he was so good and he was in a role that was similar to other roles he's played. Uh, I had met Jonathan through some other events and he knew me, but not really well. But so this is the first time working together. But Jonathan was so good that he upped the level of all of the other actors around him. It was noticeable. He finished one scene and the crew who were all veteran I surrounded myself with people better than me, with all veteran feature people on the set. And even the grips stopped and applauded for him. Uh, that's not done. And it, they did because it was that good. He's a really talented can, guy. Yeah. Well that's, well, that's where I'm coming to. How talented are you? And how can you get out of your own head and quit worrying about how you look and and how am I coming off? How am I coming off? No, you just become and do. And you know your lines. You show up early. You know, you always show up early. You're never on time. Uh, you are attentive. You walk in and you're you're solid and you're not constantly saying, what's my motivation here? What's this? What's that? You know, doing those kind of things. You, you act and be like a pro. Uh, and... To the extent that that happens, that's when you get called back. And even if it's when we did a lot of our corporate work, uh, we couldn't afford people like Jonathan and, and you know great actors, but we weren't doing a lot of dialogue. Most of it's reaction shots. I just did a seminar for uh, SAG actors uh, through the SAG Foundation, uh, and we had about 30 people, and we worked on reactions. Because most people, especially if they're doing an audition, they sit there – when the other person's talking and instead of reacting, they're looking for their next line or they're thinking about mm -hmm. their next line or they're thinking about how they look. And they're sitting there with this blank look on their face uh, when you're when the, the, the readers working with them. And I had other actors do the so it's not just plain reading. It's, you know, they're, they're trying to give them something to really react to. And they knew we were doing reaction shots. That's what the whole the drill was about on camera. And they were often pretty terrible until I pointed out, you're not doing, you're not reacting. You're looking down at throw your script on the floor. They're giving you lines and this is about a reaction shot. So you don't want to be thinking about your next line because it's going to be a cut point. And so don't worry about it. And I finally took the uh, scripts out of their hands and threw them on the floor and said, just react. And then I finally had to say, watch my fist, move your head up, move your head down. Down just do with your eyes back and forth. Practice all those things, not in just the mirror, because then you're trying to divert your eyes to the mirror. Put up a, your phone or a whatever and, and record it. Practice yeah, it's, it. It's Get so back easy to record better. yourself now. Oh, it is. Uh, you know, you have tools that actors have never had before. The other thing that's really tough is uh, you're, you're going for a part. And when I did uh, the feature, we had a speaking role. It was a one-day deal, and it was a, a SAG scale, which was $750 speaking role, which, by the way, that's what I paid uh, Jonathan Banks, to, opted to work for that amount for me, which was kind of cool. Uh, and, uh, and several other, James B. C. King and Ken Howard and some others all, all did that. It worked scale. Ken Howard was the president of SAG and he violated about 15 rules to come down and be in my film, but that's, that's another <laughs> something different. 
He's not the president coach. anymore, right? We're not going to get him in trouble. No, no, he's wow. he's it wasn't, no, it wasn't he's about since me. Passed. I was a I, I was a nobody uh, during my first uh, film, but they really liked the script. And Jim Seeking, who was his buddy, called him and said uh, that the there was another name actor who uh, got a, a big gig and couldn't make it. He says he says, Ken, we're going to go down and do this uh, small film for for a friend of mine. Can you come down? And he said, yeah, we're going to meet at the bar with this guy. I said, and he said, yeah. And Jim called me and said, well, Ken Howard's going to come down and do the part. What do you think? I said, great. I met him at the bar. We all got shitty and it was real fun the next day. But <laughs> they were they were consummate pros, consummate pros. They knew their lines cold. Uh, I gave them a uh, carte blanche to ad lib and they did a few. And they every time they did anything, they just made it better. That's what I look for in an actor. And if you're just doing a corporate thing, the fact that you can give that look and do those actions and do them so they look spontaneous, but they're completely uh, designed by you. And you're going to work with a lot of directors who don't even know exactly what they want. They want this fun look or they want this real serious look or whatever. you got to listen to them. Take a look at what the script is. There's no words around it, but what are the words? You're, you're not doing any dialogue, but what are the words around it? What were they talking about? Is it serious? Is it a little bit fun? What's that feel? And you can help figure it out uh, so that you just give them something and they go, holy, wow, that's better than what I thought. And that's what I got from working with some of the less experienced actors I actually got it working in some cases with employees. But David, you'll know that you, you're working with employees. It's a, it's a crapshoot, whether oh, yeah. they're going to be any good or not. And sometimes some of them really are amazing. They're spontaneous. They're genuine because they're not acting. And that's mm -hmm. the other thing with uh, a lot of the actors that you hire for uh, corporate work. They are always trying to act. And you just got to get over that and, and be spontaneous and be natural uh, and don't get caught at it. Yeah. I try to tell a lot of actors, um, don't just look at the, the text on the page, but try to understand the subtext of the scene and act the subtext and deliver the lines. How many of and, them have said, what's a subtext? <laughs> Well, when I get that response, I know where I'm at with my, with my actor, right? <laughs> um, but uh, it's one of the reasons why I love working with uh, Steve and Whitney so much is the two of them, when I give them that direction, they, they really kind of understand it and, and I can watch the performance change as they start to understand what the subtext of the scenes are. And it's really great well, well, when you can get, get people who, who can, who can do that, who can, read beyond the lines on the page well you know for for you guys the you actors what do you think about when you come on set that uh you are actually or at an audition you are making a pitch it's a pitch in a different way and it's not just reading the 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 lines well and and being that character in the moment you're actually on stage from the minute, minute you show up in the parking lot. The way you carry yourself, the confidence you have, the friendliness, the ability to, you know, you turn your back and you turn around and, oh, my God, you are that character I was looking for. That's very hard to do. And not very many people can do it. But if you can and then turn around and deliver a line in a way that it really means something. Wow, that's really special. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with some really great voiceover actors throughout the, my career. Um, and you know, all the way to the original, some of the early stuff with Paul Freeze. I wanted to make my little corporate work look like big time and sound and feel like big time. Paul Freeze, Dead Men Tell No Tales, the, the Disney voice, he's also mm -hmm. lots of other voices mm -hmm. too, was my voiceover for my early American Airlines work. And uh, guys like James Garner, uh, this a whole bunch of them through the years. Royal Dano, the voice of Mr. Lincoln. Uh, mm -hmm. There was one special piece I needed, and he was perfect for it. And these people walk in, 
and they just put meaning to words uh, in a way that most VO people can't do. They are actors, and they become so genuine, so real, that they are telling you the, God, the gospel. This is it. It's, it's for real. And if you can do that as an actor, whether it's voiceover or live, that is, that's the goal. That's your brand. You can deliver every time. You know, I had uh, a music- Fred, you were talking about uh, from the moment you get to the parking lot and, and how you present yourself and walk in. One of the things I, I mentioned to people who are, who are auditioning as well is remember the audition is only part of what you're looking for. I'm, when I'm looking for a lead actor, especially the performance is part of it. But that personality of the actor is so important, especially if I'm looking for a lead actor because they set the tone on my set for all the other actors. And I want somebody who I know I can trust to be a leader, be the backbone of the acting troupe and not be a distraction to getting the job done, but be a, you know, be a a pillar of support to it, you know? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and with a lot of people, you don't know what's going to happen until they're on set. Uh, mm-hmm. And and the other part is how easy are they to work with? Or do they get it? Or do you have to spend a lot of time walking them through what they should do? If you're spending a lot of time with them, they are amateurs. Uh, they should be able to really... Uh, they should really be able to capture what you're trying to get intuitively Uh, and the second, third or fourth take ought to be refinements. That's what what I liked about working with some really experienced actors is I I likened it to what it must be like for a high school football coach to suddenly have NFL players. (laughs) You're no longer, you're no longer teaching. You are now coaching and you're refining. And in many cases, the best thing you can do is walk away and say, wow, that was really, really good. Don't change a thing. Right. Uh, I love that. And I had a, I had a voiceover uh, session for an IMAX film with uh, John Forsyth, the, uh, the actor who is in Dynasty and all those other great things. Well, a great voice. That's a great channel. voice. <laughs> oh, he was terrific. Uh, he was Charlie in Charlie's Angel. Yes. So, so anyway, we finished this and it, the final – uh, run down in, in the build up to the finale, which was all original music in this IMAX film. Uh, we, we, we recorded it. Uh, second take was so good. I said, that's it. Come on in. We came in and he listened to it and he says, well, I said, that, as far as I'm concerned, that's a wrap. And he said, well, you know, if you have time, if I have time, here I am. To him, not a Hollywood guy, nobody. It's just a corporate IMAX film. And he said, I can do that better. And I said, John, I'm, I'm thrilled with it now, but if you, if you want to do one more pass, let's do it. He goes back out, and by God, he made it better. And it's, <laughs> oh, it's so much fun because oh. I didn't have to do anything. I just sat there and listened, and I knew what I wanted. That's important. And I, I, I also never, ever let anybody else sit in my voiceover sessions. Never a client is sits in my edit suite or in my voiceover sessions, ever. Yeah. I do not let them. They are not, that's not what they're there for. Yeah. You don't let, you don't let the uh, patient's cousin observe the operation, you know, in, in the hospital. It's the, it's the same thing. They're counting on you to do it. There's one other thing that I, I can say, because it applies to actors just as much as anything else, as any, anybody else in our business. And that is a trumpet teacher told me uh, just right after I turned pro at 17 years old. He said, I don't care if you're playing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. You play it like a damn pro. <laughs> There is no small part. There is no little production. As a producer and as a director, your brand and your reputation are on the line 
And as an actor, every time you walk out there or walk into an audition, you as a person are being judged and your work will be judged. And if you walk away from something and you've done a scene and it's really good and everybody goes, wow, that, that's, that's the payoff. And a quick comment about the ROI. The ROI was when a, that I count as the best ROI, is when the video you created for a single event use is used for the next five to 10 years because it's so good. And I've had that happen over and over again on not real often, but enough that I can say probably a dozen times. Yeah. Uh, one of them was one of them was a uh, video we did for the U S air force. And uh, the assignment was tell the story of the U S air force from world war one to the present, do it in less than seven minutes and make it emotional. Yeah. My, uh, my father, um, who was my business partner before he passed away. Um, his, his kind of edict with us was we're not going to judge our success by the money we make, but by how much people want to come back to work with us again. He's absolutely right. That is brilliant. That is brilliant. I always used to say, if you do a great job, the money will be there because for for some in this business, it is all about the money. For others of us, like yourself and me, uh, we are essentially performers, and we're we're there for the the applause and the ability to really have some fun doing creative work. That's what yeah. we love, and our payoff is the accolades and all of that. But if you got to be smart about it and have a, a business brain, but if you do. And you start to leverage up to bigger and bigger clients. And if you want bigger clients, you got to go where bigger clients are. And, and for the most part, they're not in San Diego. Right. Uh, there's a few. But most of them, when they want something really big, they go to L.A. You're San Diego. You can't be any good. That's why I had almost no San Diego big clients. They were all East Coast and international, uh, like right. Sony Japan. Uh, it, those kinds of things, you, you, you work up to them, but you get that image based on the small stuff. So even the smallest project needs to somehow have your little signature on it that, oh, wow, this is really good. So there you go. Absolutely. So Fred, uh, you've given us a lot of good advice. Um, your book is advocating for the audience or advocate for the audience. Um, where can people pick that up? Well, I was going to, I've had two or three opportunities to put it on Amazon and I did not because uh, they wanted me to change my price from uh, 25 bucks a copy to $65 a copy. And then, in, uh, and then I'd get maybe 20 cents every time they sell one. Uh, and it's, it's a limited kind of thing. So uh, I'm making it available on my website and uh, I'll, I'll mail them out. And uh, so it's, 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 it's available on my website, fredashman.com, about as easy as it gets, F-R-E-D-A-S-H-M-A-N.com. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, are you working on anything right now, Fred? Yeah, I am. Uh, the Gloria Gold Show, which has been in development, <laughs> in development, that means they're looking for money, uh, for the mm -hmm. past uh, three years, is finally come up. She's, she's come up with a, the funding for the next phase. And I've been retained as executive producer uh, and I'll, I'll be the showrunner uh, for this new uh, concept, which is really a musical variety with a huge Latin uh, accent to it, meaning that it'll be done in Spanglish. Uh, it'll oh, be fantastic. half in English, half in Spanish, and it's aimed at the bilingual Latin audience globally, which is huge and growing, especially the U.S., but there's two, a dual um, uh, distribution channel both south of the border uh, all the way through Latin America and here in the U.S. So we'll be featuring a lot of Latin talent, all Latin talent uh, coming from uh, as far away as Argentina and uh, all over the world, as well as 
a lot of unknown and some known U.S. talent. And uh, it'll be a one hour. Um, and it's going to have the more of the look of uh, Sabado, uh, Global Sabado, that show that was on. But it's uh, so it's got all of the excitement and, and flair of that spa Spanish language show, but it uh, also has the production values of, of uh, shows like The Voice and Dancing with the Stars, which have very high production value. We're probably going to be shooting it uh, at, we're negotiating right now with uh, some casinos in Las Vegas. So we'll probably be yeah. shooting it there. You can, um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but we're definitely out of California because of AB5. Right. <laughs> right. Who, can you speak yeah. to AB5 for a moment? Because I would be very curious how you feel about that. I think that it is uh, a move to control and take away freedom from all of us who work freelance. Uh, as they, I've run a large production company for 40 years, uh, we run payroll on up, up to a thousand people, payroll on up to a thousand people a year sometimes, but we had a lot of freelance people. Uh, and some of them uh, made more than 50% of their income from us. So they had to, we had to start doing the employee thing with them, but they're still part time. And the problem is, it, as soon as you have to start running payroll, the whole tax situation increase it and, and just the cost of handling all the paperwork and the reports kill you. I had to have a full-time person just doing all the reports for the, the feds in the state. And if you don't do the reports and some of them are pretty silly reports, but they're extensive on everybody that you've hired. Uh, if you don't do those reports, it's like a $50,000 fine. So the cost Jeez. of all of that, yeah, all that paperwork starts adding up. And we were big enough that we were on their radar. And uh, they came in one time and did an audit and they said, well, these people shouldn't be, uh, and this is before AB5, these people should be payrolled, not, not uh, freelance. But they are freelancers. They're working for everybody. And they said, no, you're going to have to payroll. So now my costs go up, but all the other producers that they're working with in town, which is a lot of them, uh, didn't have to do that because they actually told us, well, you're, you're big enough now. You guys are, you know, multi-million dollar company. So uh, we're coming after you. And if you don't do it, it's we could find we could go back five years and find you fifteen thousand dollars per person that you that we think that you should have had. And there's no appeal. Sounds so a little like extortion. Oh, you think? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the the Godfather had it right except it's government when they do that. And they have also the point of a gun. So, yeah. So they said, but we can see that you were trying to do it the right way. So we're just going to fine you $15,000 flat. And then these people have to be payroll from now on. So it's not just the cost of the actual payroll, but I also provided uh, benefits that I, because these people were true, either part that either became part-time people because they were still on call uh, when we needed them only. Uh, but I provided all my people with uh, profit sharing, paid vacations, uh, 401k, and partially paid health insurance in my little company here in San Diego. And we did that for you still uh, 35 hiring? years. No, no, I cl we closed up in 2014. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> but... And it was very hard to get with us. I, I would only hire uh, new new people coming in on the production side. I had to have a college degree, and they would come in as a paid intern. I never had unpaid interns because you get what you pay for. Uh, right. And if they, did, if they didn't get picked up and, and really showed us that they would could last, you know, t stand the test of time and the pressure, uh, then they were let go within uh, – usually 60 days. Uh, but a few of them who started with us went on to make uh, six-figure salaries and then uh, went on their own successfully on, and did their own companies. And so, yeah, it, it was a training ground. So some of the people said, hey, hey, have you ever done any teaching? And one of the people at San Diego State asked me that, and I, and I said no initially. And then 
uh, I came home and told my wife what I said. He says, she says, you've been teaching people for 40 years. What do you mean? No, <laughs> it's just a, <laughs> not in, not in a, uh, the school environment, which brings right. up one other thing I'd like to do. And uh, I'm thinking about doing this within the next week or so. Uh, is and I'd like David's help in, in particular on this, and everybody really to weigh in. I would like to do a two-hour to three-hour masterclass for production people, specifically writer, producers, and directors here in town uh, online, uh, and limit to to about thirty people. So there's a little bit of intera- interaction, and do that sometime, probably ne- within the next ten days. Uh, what do you guys think of that? And should I pursue it? Yeah, I think it'd be should. free. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think a, it sounds like a good idea. There's a there's a desire right now for people to connect and uh, and uh, use this time to to learn and grow. Uh, exactly. Uh, I mean, I mean this this uh, situation is going to end someday. <laughs> we're hoping, and. Uh, it would be nice to have uh, that information under our belts. Well, I'll, I'll let you know, and I'll be on online on the various websites uh, promoting it. If, if we get to go, if, if it gets going, uh, I just wanted to get your feedback. If you thought it, it would be a good thing. And uh, if I have enough to, to share. Yeah. Well, I mean, last night we did a, I, I moderated a director's panel um, for film consortium. And uh, we had uh, six of us, seven of us on the panel, and we had over a thousand people tune in last night um, with very little announcement and very little uh, ability to find it just kind of randomly. <laughs> uh, we still well, maybe had, we still had like, over a thousand people watching. So pe- people want to like learn time. right now. Yeah. yeah. And with, with video as well? Yeah. Yeah, it was video. Yeah. Okay. Well, what, uh, just to you know, kind of wrap up a couple of th- thoughts. Uh, the the big piece that I did for the Air Force, there was not one word of narration, nor was there one graphic in the entire thing, except right at the end, it was the Air Force logo, and it was all the story was told in pictures and music, all original mm-hmm. score. And I've used one of the success most successful tools that I've used is original music. And in some cases, I have put 50% of the budget into the original music score. Wow. Uh, because that is how we can even the playing field about not having the kind of actors that you can do dialogue with and just make it look and feel big time. And that was using music to tell the story with some really good singers. Uh, studio types and studio musicians. But if you can do that and you can get the right composer and lyric, you can tell that story in music. And that mm-hmm. particular piece that we, we did that for that dedication of the Air Force Memorial, our audience was 50,000 people walking on jumbotrons around the Pentagon. Plus up at the site, we had all the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the President of the United States, and the heads of every air force in the world and the leadership of all of the aerospace companies in the world. Uh, and it'll talk about a little bit of pressure, but the, it went over so well. And we had, uh, I, when they first premiered it at the night before a uh, banquet for all the hotshot big time people, uh, I wasn't even allowed to be there. Security was so tight. The general, uh, retired general who was in charge called me and says, Fred, it worked. Uh, I've never seen so many people with all that brass with tears in their eyes. And that video became the signature video for the Secretary of the Air Force for the next two years at speeches. And to this day, more than 10 years later, 15 years later, it is still being shown at the Air Force Academy to incoming cadets. That's fantastic. That... Ladies and gentlemen, it's ROI. Well, it's ROI. And it wasn't just me. I surround myself with people. My DP is a better camera guy than I ever dreamed of being. My editor, uh, Tim Flora, was fantastic. Uh, 
you know, you get the people that you can trust and you set the stage just like a good director does and you let the actors act. Our job isn't to direct. Our job is to facilitate and set the stage and let them do their work. And the better the people you surround yourself with, the better your work's going to be. And that's how I was able to be so successful for so many years. That's great advice, uh, Fred. And I think on that piece, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up this call. Uh, anybody looking to get a get Fred's book, go to fredashman.com. Uh, I would highly recommend it. Fred's got a lot of really great advice and he's got a lot of really great stories, which I'm sure are also in the book. Um, Fred, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with us once again. Good. Well, I look forward to chatting with you again soon. And anytime I can uh, join you for any of the roundtables or anything here in town, I'm, I'm available to do it. I'm in the mode of giving back. Fantastic. I will definitely hit you up on that uh, when the opportunity comes up. Steve and Whitney, thank you guys for joining joining me again for another Always uh, a pleasure. Podcast. Thank you for having us in involved thank you david and, and thank uh, you go ahead fred thank you whitney and steve it was a pleasure talking oh. with you and yes my pleasure to be on the show pleasure talking to you too fred fantastic and for those of you listening in who've made it to the end of the episode thank you very much for joining us on the intellectual podcast be sure to check out the rest of our catalog on itunes or google play or uh Spotify, wherever you consume your podcasts and do us a favor and check out the Gunna Geek Network at gunnageek.com. That's the uh, network of podcasts that we're a proud part of. A lot of geeky information there uh, about podcasting, about film, about uh, pop culture at large. You'll enjoy pretty much any one of the podcasts you find there. It's gunnageek.com. Until next time, this is the Intellectual Podcast. I'm your host, David S. Dawson. We will talk again very, very soon. Hello there, citizens. I am the terror that flaps in the night. I am the floaty that will not flush no matter how many times you try in the toilet bowl of crime. I am Darkwing Duck. Telling you, please, talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. <laughs> Whatever the heck that means. After all, you are watching Intellectual Podcast with your ears. Intellectual Podcast.